So, I'm going to fight, and this is my lab. I've always been fascinated by the world since I was little. By my own means, I try to understand this world by, for example, teaching myself things such as physics, and trying to learn from people that were obviously better than me when I was 10, like you were with. <laughs> Although, early on I realized that if I wanted to modify, create, and not just understand, I'd be faced with a lot of, uh, we don't know if this is possible. Uh, we don't quite understand this, and that's why I turned to hacking. Hacking allowed me to develop a structuralistic approach by understanding something that was already well documented piece by piece, and modify it as I wished, giving me a feel for later research projects. I'd like to share the way I try to understand things and modify them throughout this video, by giving a broad overview of this subject so that people can understand the whole idea of what it is like to reverse engineer and modify a piece of electronics. I am also trying to not dump it down and give a general idea to allow everyone to document it itself. So why a piano? I've always been into music since I was little, convincing the conservatory director to let me try violin at a very young age. My interest in music never stopped. And eventually, I turned to the composition world, which allowed me to learn how to play the piano. I was inspired to do this by the CCC talks about Tamagotchis. I believe it was one of the best intro to hardware I can have seen, while not making the mistake to go on either way to complex or simple machines by choosing a weird but simple one. The MIDI keyboard I chose is an Akai MPK61, solely because of the fact that it's what I hope. It's a pretty high-end MIDI keyboard, which means that you have to connect it to a computer to produce any sound at all, MIDI being a way to encode music notes, not the music wave itself. When opening a device, I usually take a picture of its back before it is unscrewed, then several of each screw all, with a screw next to them. I then put all these screws in a safe place to not lose them. This allows me to remember which screws belong where, their size, and so on. Taking pictures at each step allows me to not forget to, say, reconnect a device if the world is a bit more advanced. After I am done breaking down the electronics, I usually like to create a mental map of the old device. You can see here that I'm writing it down in the form of schematics, but most of the time it's just one of notes I throw together in a text editor and my brain does the rest of it all. I try to identify the parts that I should target versus the useless ones from a hacker's point of view, such as, in that case, the input outputs, which are being pretty much the LEDs, keyboards, and the wall part with the LCD and the rest. From seeing, I can conclude that they're not too complicated, despite being useful. The LED board simply connects every diode to a single plug, and so does the LCD board, with a custom LCD being used instead, of course. Next on the list is to get an overview of what could be useful in the case of the main electronic board. We can already see something below the CPU, which seems to be a field programmable gateway, an FPGA for short, but despite first glance, is actually a complex programmable logic device, CPLD with a lot of ports, both of which allows you to program electronic circuits. We can also note that unplugged ports in our overview of both the rest usefulness-wise, as those can be used for debugging. With everything noted, we can finally unplug the board and take pictures of it, which can be useful later on for tracking down connections. Now that we feel like we have a confident enough understanding of the surface, let's try to get to our potential first targets already. Testing the CPU and CPLD is usually done through a non-standard connection called JPI, which is different for each component. We will first try scanning for spots to see if we can already find any of them operating under at least what is common of the JTAG. For this, I use a tool called the JTAGulator, because this is what I have currently on the end. However, if you don't have the money to spend on this piece of equipment, an Arduino can do the work, if I are not programmed correctly. And there we go! Results found for the first part. I'm also scanning the second part too, but we can make an educated guess that one of them is for the CPU, 
and the other is for the CPLD. In addition, if you can't find any unused connectors on the pod, you can look for test points, which most likely look like big, soldered or not, conductive points on the board compared to the rest of the surface. The pictures I took earlier could have been used to map out those connections of those points to see where they are connected and avoid connecting them to unrelated pods. If the board had more than two layers of electronics though, you most likely won't be able to trace back those points and would be left with a few other options. To test out all test points with a tool such as the data culator, to wire tightly the data pins in the CPU, which could be tricky but as those pins are usually documented, you can do it if you have a good enough soldering high one. You can also just scrap out layer by layer your electronic board to map out all the connections and act barbaric. That would work, but would also be on a bucket. Now that we identified the JTAG, let's see if we can make use of it. For this, I'm using OpenOCD, a free and open source tool that can interface with JTAG, connected to a bus pipeline. This, again, is all that I had on and that worked for me, but other tools than the bus pipeline could have been used with it. The first step with OpenOCD is to configure it for, for the current target, hoping it is already implemented Quaming despair if your target is unimplemented, and digging your own grave if its JTAG interface is not documented. In our case, as noted on earlier from what was written in the chip, it's an ARM STF32F1 something, so let's go with that. Few moments later, and booyah, we're in! But if you're yelling about your accomplishment yet, try to see if you can read with flash memory what contains the code the CPU executes, because manufacturers usually lock down reading after shipping to avoid any hackers to have an easier job. In this case, we can easily read the flash, so it's a win. In addition, if the JTAG didn't allow us to dump the flash memory, unless you can make the code dump itself through some of the tricks, you need to go the barbaric way and dump the CPU in ACID, scrape it to map out every layer of electronics, and to finally find the floating gate transistor of the flash memory, analyzing them one by one to get the software code bit per bit. Needless to say, due to the complexity and the costs required, it requires an SEM microscope, an SEM microscope. You usually, really, really do not go to go that way. Although this has been done for proprietary chipsets with no documentation available, so add it to reverse engineer them at the electronics gate lever or to dump by end, for example, the Game Boy Boot Run. No kidding. Now that we got our flash extracted, it should be wise to at least try to read it. If you're looking at how to pass the file, when stumbling around fairly unknown data, I turn to run it against tools such as VLS or binvis.io to quickly see what the file is and what does it contain. In a nutshell, those kind of tools associate visual patterns to data patterns, allowing you to see much better the discrepancies that you otherwise would by looking at hundreds of lines of hexadecimal. For example, let us say I'm painted something with pretty dark colors, except in the middle, you'll notice it right away. For a file, it would be kind of trickier if we couldn't see it through visual feedback. To come back to the main subject though, to understand what this flash is and how it works we should, before anything, try to look at the CPU documentation about the flash format, or try to find compilers online for the kind of CPU you are working with, which could allow you to see how the binary files are formed. To expand on this subject, compilers use what we call linker files, which are basically a fancy name for we will put code at this place, data at this place, but this address with several bytes, etc. Basically, it gives you the format and where the raw code is, which will come in handy when trying to reverse engineer a flash file. After reading a bit through some docs a couple of times and understanding basically the flash format of the ARM STM32 CPU, I understood that the first four bytes were the beginning stack pointer followed by the reset vector. What is this, you may ask? Well then, it's simple. This is our entry point. If you still didn't got it, this is where code actually is and where it starts executing stuff. 
The format itself is a 4 bytes little entian value in which you substitute to one. Nothing too fancy there. Now, onto some actual reverse engineering work. I myself use Waterway too. Some might like it, some hate it, but it is my default choice unless something screws up. Then, whatever works, be it freeware version of Hopper, Binary Ninja, or a quad version of Ida. Yeah, I said quad because A, I almost never use either, and B, dude, what the fuck have you smoked to the prices? Like, even a be stepped on price wise to get more attractive, and don't go tell me you're having issues with money, you've been one of the biggest shareholders in the market for a good while now. Anyways, one aside, the most obvious thing to do after being able to load the firmware is to understand what it does. For that, I'm going to explain first the layout and how everything works out, and then try to explain how I figured those things out. The firmware is divided into two main parts, or three, depending on your way to see things. The first part is the bootloader. It doesn't do much about checking for the main firmware to be presented booting it. Although it contains an Indian menu, but more on to that later. The second part starts at DYX4000 and is what I'm calling the user code, even though the user has no control over that. It is the thing that handles the key pressed, the buttons, the parts, equalizer, the LCD, input feedback, and all the fancy stuff that makes this device a piano. The last part is at DOX20000 and finish at DOX40000, being coincidentally the end of the 256 kilobytes of the flash memory. It is the data part, containing something called presets. Basically, when you want to compose music on your computer, your hardware, also known as your piano, has to know how to talk to the software, also known as your digital audio workstation. What the sliders on the equalizer are linked to in the software, and what the pads, potentiometers, or even recording buttons should be linked to. MIDI keyboards have an automated way of handling that called presets, which basically tell the software, hey, this button is connected to that, without having to do it yourself manually. As a funny note, we can guess that the full name of the engineer that designed and programmed the board was Richard Edmonds, as his family name was printed in the silk of the PCB, and his first name on the software. Moving on, it verifies both strings to ensure that the user code is actually present before trying to boot and, failure to that, launch the bootloader we call the menu. You can also force launch this menu by using the key combination dash dash stop and wake. This menu allows you to erase the user code and update it. For the user code, you basically have a main loop rendering each frame of the LCD and listening for user inputs, sending back MIDI packets. This contains the settings, menus, and various visual feedbacks of the data sent, such as the scaling tower when using pads or slider. Now, here comes the fun part to explain. How did I understand how this piano worked? Well, I can't do a full crash course on assembly in one video, but when you analyze binary code, it is far from being even seemingly the same as the source code you compile to make the executable. You cannot read back the software as if it was source code and just read it like a book. Instead, this code is compiled into an assembly grade, a low-level code that the CPU can understand. Instead of having a huge set of functions you could use, define, and search, an assembly grade have a set of defined instructions which are just made to do mathematical operations and deal with memory. Example, move data x at place y, add 2 to variable x, y, z, etc. Even funnier is that this actually is sufficient to do pretty much everything. You might wonder how the program can now do arithmetical tests with a subset of functions so little, and well, let's put it this way. You subtract 16 to a variable. This operation returns an overflow flag if the variable is less than 16, since the value comes from 0 to max value when decreasing in the electronics world. Then the program decides to change a variable since your value is less than 16, which happens to be a value called the process counter, telling your program which data to execute, which successfully allows you to redirect code execution. This might seem crazy, but I have even better. 
a compiler exists that compiles your software using only one operation, mouth. An operation to move value from one place to another. That's right, you can have a full computer by adding only one mathematical operation. Now that we view assembly as just a bunch of math operations, how do we distinguish one from another? How do we think that this function allows you to print text on the LCD and this one to wait for one mini packet to be received? There are two ways to approach this problem, and I'll begin by the hardest as you cannot always use the second method. Static analysis. In static analysis, all is about patterns. You start from what you know, being the entry point of the program or strings the program uses, and make your way down the rabbit hole. Let us look at the bootloader recovery menu, for example. We see that it calls a function with twice the same strings at two different addresses. And if you follow the functions that actually compares them, and pass the string now firmware to another function. This way you can understand that the last function called with the string is a print to the LCD screen, but a firmware exists inside the flash boot ROM, which you now roughly know the address, but is customizable, as it can warn you about the firmware not being found. So much for just guessing what some functions do. For trickier instructions, modifying value in memory, such as UX E00, E100, which you don't fully understand, you usually check out the CPU documentation for them. In that case, the documentation tells us it is related to the NVIC IRQ, which in a nutshell is used to change interrupts. As we already know, interrupts are addresses at which you can go if anything goes wrong, or just to start with program. But interrupts can also be used to listen at inputs. For example, each time you type with your keyboard, an interrupt is triggered, which launches the loop telling the software, hey, this key has been pressed. The same is true for input outputs. Usually, just trying to see which address it is, poking and reading the documentation will help us tremendous. But that isn't always the best approach to reverse engineer a software. So here comes dynamic analysis. This method is the computer representation of poking fire with a wood stick and see if it burns. No, really. We start with something we call a debugger, which can allow us to trace back every instruction executed, stop at a point of the software, skip a bunch of instructions, and jump at turnover place of the software, etc. For this, using my current setup with the debug JDAG access, we will use JDB, a debugger connected to OpenOCD. As you can see, connecting isn't hard, and the work is even less. You usually put down a breakpoint, which is something which allows you to pause the program, step through some instructions, and try to see what they do by comparing registers, our variables, the stack, a bigger list of data, our memory, or even the inputs outputs, such as the LCDs, packets sent through the USB cable, etc. On top of all of that, software such as Wadaway 2 shows you a visual representation of the program, not unlike the mental map we made at the beginning allowing us to see what would happen in case this or that failed or not. In the end, it's all about recognizing patterns within documentation and hoping that the fire we are poking won't burn us too harshly. Now that we have a global understanding of how this piano works, the most obvious thing would be to take it over, i.e. when your own code on it. For that, usually, you try to seek up compilers on the net that would suit your particular type of CPU or failure to find something good enough, just make up linker scripts on top of a compiler for the given architecture and build your own libraries. In that case, I used OpenSTM32. While I greatly despised the GUI interface, I've just used it to create make files to automatically build the firmware, linking the libraries I needed together so that I wouldn't have to do it myself. At first, I just tried to get an hardware abstraction layer, HAL, working, so that I could use easily most IOs of the board and change their configuration if needed. For example, if one IO was linked to an unstandard pin of the CPU. Getting the HAL working was actually rather easy as soon as I got a somewhat stable data setup. I then, through some reverse engineering, got the USART port used, standard USART 2, 
and began working my way towards what I wanted to do. But first, let's talk about how the wallboard was programmed and designed. So, I want to say that since quite a while now, the design should have correctly written of this video. What the fuck is this bullshit? Okay, this board was made in 2009, 9 years ago currently, so I can understand about the fact that they left the flash in weird white mode and not white only. That's just one stupid mistake, but after all, security of a piano wasn't exactly one of the main goal. And the engineer could just have been nice and let users hack the device if they wished, who knows? But now, what the fuck is wrong with your update system? I mean, you just swipe back into the firmware section when it's sent over USB, and as slow shape before executing it, you will find that the string epk 88 Richard is there at the beginning. Not only does this allow work updates, but those work updates have full control over your piano, including the power to modify the bootloader or to remove it, breaking the piano altogether. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, because they are storage settings of the piano in the CPU flash. In the CPU flash! Not like every other electronic bot ever used a separate flash device or EEPROM to do that. After all, what could go wrong by writing to critical storage space while the piano is running, such on which cannot be modified by the user? Also, a fucking course storing the settings this way force the memory log bits to be disabled, thereby making firmware readback possible. Unless you forcefully succeed into disabling JTAG and making sure you need to erase the firmware to enable it, but that would be really over engineering at this point, plus I'm not even sure this is how we go. And so, this could have been a factor of attack, as the CPU is reading from its flash, using a glitch attack, you could have tweaked the CPU into reading its own code. Anyways, the whole chain of trust is entirely broken, not like there was even one to begin with, and users are allowed to break their pianos with wrong dates. I personally am all for letting users do what they wish with their materials, but knowing how the weapon does, I do not think this was the primary idea in mind, unfortunately. Now that we own the device, what could we do? Well, let's think like a hacker now, shall we? What could be cool? My first idea was to dig at computers from this piano. Indeed, the piano having a USB port and us having complete control of what is running, we could theoretically transform our piano into a USB keyboard thereby allowing us to send as quickly as possible key presses that would open a terminal and launch an executable, which could link back to us, allowing us therefore to control the computer without the person knowing. But recently, some exploits have been published for the Linux kernel, specifically 14 USB kernel exploits. So, kernel to kernel exploit? Seems like a deal to me. Another thing that could have been cool would have been to simply wait for a G to be played and then play back the Flintstones theme, disregarding any input from the user. I unfortunately don't have enough time to really explain either, nor is it really the subject of this video, focused on hardware hacking, not software hacking. But I'll get back to software hacking a bit at the end. Either way, we own the device and the project is successful, reliable code execution on a piano, work update and Linux kernel exploit. Now that we more or less finished the project for the piano, except for the exploitation part which I do not have the time to explain in that video, let us review a bit of hardware exploitation as a whole. While I actually have shown a fairly straightforward approach on how to get the firmware, Hardware exploits can also be used to make the hardware reveal important data. Such an attack can be a correlation power analysis, which, in a nutshell, analyzes the voltage that the CPU takes. The CPU needs to take more or less voltage to modify the state of logic gate inside it, simply put, and correlates it to known cryptographic algorithms, allowing you to retrieve one cryptographic key only from knowing the voltage that the CPU used to in the operation. In the same kind of attacks, you also have glitch attacks, which tries to change the behavior of a program through changing the voltage of its supposed stable voltage line. 
This can lead to a bad instruction being passed and the CPU jumping to an error vector, to a variable being corrupted, and nice things like this. You can also do this through glitching the clock, supposed to, well, be a clock, and so have a stable frequency of through other means. The sky is the limit for entirely unknown chips. If you're jumping through your fancy 100k Eros SEM microscopes and burning you alive with acid, you can always try a logic analyzer to see the data being sent and received from this chip, which would let you visualize data in the form of high and low in 1 and 0 in binary. A more advanced voltage checker would be an oscilloscope, which would be a bit less used at its use is usually just to check differences between voltage, and chips usually interact between each other in binary, which introduce always similar voltage change. You also have other attacks, such as Twitter attacks, which was forcing hardware to write protected data at an unprotected memory region by simply linking those two memory regions together. It might still be possible depending on the hardware, but are pretty much relying on what you have, so I cannot really be general about it. The best way to think about it is to have a mental map and analyze all the possible factors of attacks, sort them by difficulty and research about them is different for each device you are trying to work. Really. For complex devices, such as those with Linux embedded, you also usually have an UART port somewhere on the board we should, should be able to find thanks to the JTAGU later, allowing you to interact with the board. Coupled with your JTAG access, you can skip the Linux login screen and have a shell. And I'm down. I hope you enjoyed this video, I did enjoy creating it at least, and if you have any criticisms on the format, my accent, or if you want to see me funny hell or like the content, you can find me on Twitter at Comunify, my mail address Comunify at Anachi.pw, and I also have a blog Comunify.com, which will contain a follow up article for this video. I will also be present at the Coast Communication Congress at Leipzig, the, and we'll do a conference the 28th December at 12.25am Leipzig time. So if you want to see me there, I'll be there, and I'll be demoing this piano. So, I'm just going to